So, and I'm Tom Hickerson, and I'm going to lead off in the presentation. And my colleague, uh, Shauna Sadler, will, uh, will pick up after that. So the University of Calgary is ne nearing the completion of the Taylor Family Digital Library, a new 265,000 square feet facility in the center of the campus, housing the main library, university archives, the University Art Museum, and the University Press. At this time also a high density facility for a storage facility is being uh, built at the edge of the city uh, where uh, in addition to books and journals, art and archives and artifacts will also be housed. These facilities reflect the, the integrated mission of libraries and cultural resources, a principal division of the, of the University of Calgary, and also uh, reflect our vision for the convergence of knowledge and culture. And this is what it looks like in the daytime, and I'm going to show you the nighttime shortly, so, uh, which is really my favorite. Uh, today's presentation is about the development of a technology plan appropriate to supporting 21st century research and learning, to serving as a central hub for information and media dissemination campus-wide, and to being a, a center for art and culture, uh, cultural heritage uh, for the city, the region, and beyond. I really love this at night, and, and um, my colleague, the Associate Vice, Vice President for Facilities, who worked as a partner with it, said, you know, when we were looking at the various images, because we're in Canada, he said, you know, we should really care what it looks like at night, because that's the way most people will see it. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, uh, but it also is a sort of illuminated presence, a, a center for, uh, for knowledge and activity um, being, uh, uh, sort of transmitted out across the heart of the campus during the nighttime hours. Uh, before turning to um, uh, comments specifically to the technologies, I want to say a few words about uh, underlying vision. In our design for the future, the concept of media is elemental. It is the medium in which information, image, and sound is manifest. It's the form in which knowledge is, is created and the means by which art, intelligence, and understanding is disseminated. And while not all media is digital, and in fact, the Taylor includes uh, large collections of books and journals and uh, special collections and, and artifacts, digital te technologies exercise an increasingly ubiquitous, ubiquitous role in, re in recording and communicating the human experience. Therefore, visual display, audio and visual video utilization, and multidimensional visualization are crucial capabilities. Collaboration is, center, is central to current day technology's role in the, in the creation of knowledge and its use. Pla presently, touch is pivotal in information manipulation. And as the collection of the 21st century evolves, the capacity to reflect real-time data uh, will, be, will be of increasing importance. Additionally, we assume that change will be constant and that the technologies should be empowering, convenient, and really cool. So the outline for today's talk is to talk about an organizational overview, project overview, realignment and strategic planning, role of technology consultants in this project, the technologies themselves, and where we found ideas and inspiration. So the University of Calgary is only 45 years old. It's located in a, in a million person city in, uh, in Western Canada and Alberta. Uh, it has about 30,000 students, 19% uh, of which are graduate students and libraries and cultural resources as principal division. Uh, the Taylor Family Digital Library is an element of that. There are five campus branches, the University Art Museum, University of Calgary Press, the High Density Storage Facility. We have a nursing uh, uh, facility, a nursing faculty in uh, Doha, Qatar, and uh, operate the library there. 
We also operate the Health Information Network, which provides access to electronic information for uh, physicians and researchers and health and wellness professionals. And uh, in that role, we run uh, uh, knowledge centers, small libraries, and all the major uh, hospitals in the region and the Tom Baker Cancer Institute. The Military Museums is one of the two historical facilities of the Canadian Forces, and we run a library and archives there and oversee the art gallery. And also the newly uh, constructed downtown campus gives us a library in the heart of the city and is, a, is a, an avenue uh, whereby we can strengthen our outreach to the, uh, to the Calgary community. We also want the building to be a hub for innovation in the sense that it's not just what's in the building. And this has actually influenced the kinds of renovations we're doing in the other facilities on campus. Uh, Health Sciences Library is a particular example of that that's employing the models that we developed uh, for the Taylor. Uh, downtown campus is doing similarly. Science and Engineering has a uh, uh, digital globe um, like those that we're incorporating into the Taylor. And also we have a public art program uh, that provides art for a lot of the newer buildings on campus and is, is part of our, uh, our community outreach in terms of campus-wide, but also across the city. In order to accomplish this, we conducted, uh, to prepare for the move into the building, uh, we conducted a, a strategic review process. Uh, in this process, we took curators, museum curators, librarians, archivists, uh, also managerial and support staff, faculty from other departments, campus IT, and we, be, we uh, developed six teams that were organized around areas of activity, not functional. So in fact, then they included representatives and they thought about how can we all contribute to this. And those included learning, collections, research, technology, and media, outreach and community relations, and staffing. And while those groups did lots of interviews, did focus groups with the uh, student government groups, um, one of the most important things we did were more than 30 uh, hour-long interviews with faculty members in many disciplines across the campus. And we learned a lot about our successes and unfortunately a little bit about our failures. Um, and out of that came a new organization uh, arranged around areas of outcome rather than functional activities that allowed us to bring together the various disciplines and the various collections in the pursuit of, of, of common uh, production and common outcomes. And those are around research, collections, learning, and Center for Scholarly Communication. The, the building had a, uh, a principal project team, and those include Shauna, who I'll say a few words about uh, later, who focused on uh, on the technology for the plan for the building, um, but also something that grew out of that was is that she also became uh, responsible for the public furniture. So the relationship between furniture and the technologies employed is one that you might not see on day one, but it's absolutely essential. And it's it it uh, it's amazing how the the technologies and the and the furniture work in common. Um, Jackie Bell worked with me on the on the side of the program on. Um, the various uh, programmatic entities in the building, how they should be organized in the building, size of areas, proximity to other uh, related activities in this very large building. Um, in the project overview, um, the, uh, our principal partners in terms of the people who worked with us in building of the building, um, Orcasian uh, Architecture and Design, a firm uh, based in, in, uh, in Vancouver, but also with a large office in Calgary, um, which actually is increasingly has most of its offices in China, is my, my sense of, of their uh, current development. They did not have experience in building um, libraries. And uh, as it turned out, that probably was a good idea because uh, we're really not a very conventional um, library. When I mentioned the art museum, the art museum is, is right in the center of the building. It's right on main hallway through the building. Uh, it opens above. Uh, students can see down from the learning commons into a two, uh, 
a two floor major major gallery and uh, and went from a situation where they have about 25,000 visitors a year to a situation where five to 10,000 people will walk by their door every day. So, um, and, and we really had some programmatic aspects that would not have been common um, to libraries uh, built in previous days. Um, so they came to us with a lot, with a real open mind about what this building might be. Uh, Canna Construction was the construction manager and principal construction company. Stantec was the principal engineering firm. And, um, um, and uh, uh, Sextant, uh, Sextant Technology Consultants, and uh, Shauna will talk about them. Uh, in a few moments, they were the principal uh, uh, audiovisual and technology consultants on the, on the program. We did not hire them. Uh, they came with the bid from the architects, and the bid from the architects, all of these groups were chosen before I arrived in Calgary four and a half years ago. Uh, they were chosen by our campus facilities development and maintenance group, who we worked very closely with. In fact, the associate vice president that I mentioned, he and I are the ones that have our, uh, our names on the schematics for every floor in the building. So uh, if there's any credit, well, that'll be good. If, uh, but we also have the blame. I was responsible for the programmatic layout of the building and all the various floors, and he was responsible for the construction and engineering elements. So one of the, the things, as I said, we assume change is constant. So we wanted to build a building that was right um, for 2011, but would be right for 2015 and 2020 and 2025 in ways that we uh, presently don't foresee. So one of the things that we were insistent on, and we had a real premium in cost around uh, having access flooring, raised flooring, which allows you to have all your network connections um, and uh, electrical uh, in the floor, which allows you to bring that up in any place in the building. We also, 60% of our walls are demountable, so we assume that someone else will change the building in, in, uh, in very dynamic ways on a regular basis over time, and this allows them the ability to do that. Also, another great thing about the raised flooring is, is that all of the heating and cooling is there. So it's uh, what's called a filled plenium. The air is, is just there, and you open vents uh, in the floor that allow the air to rise. So you don't have hot air being forced down from uh, those little fans that are in all of your offices that don't work about half the time. Um, and um, uh, so it's also uh, about the healthiest air possible for, uh, for human existence. We also really um, probably overbuilt the technological capability of the building in terms of, of planning for the future. Uh, the two uh, 10 uh, gig um, fiber backbones um, are really um, beyond what we need on day one, but they really were necessary to provide the kind of distribution uh, that we wanted. Uh, there are a lot of antennas all over the building for, for, uh, for wireless support. Um, some sort of, re sort of remarkable statistics on the number of network ports and so forth. Um, so it's a very complex building in terms of the construction. So we moved from the construction to choosing the technologies. And um, this is the point that I'm gonna, gonna turn it over to, uh, to Shauna, who served as the technology officer for the building. And uh, I'll say a couple of words about, about um, choosing her to do this job, because um, beyond the basic construction uh, and the network infrastructure, we had about $13 million to spend on technology. And um, none of us were prepared to know what in the 21st century exactly we should be spending uh, that money on and what were the capabilities. Um, Shauna was the uh, coordinator for digital initiatives. She had set up our institutional repository, one of the first in Canada, and also ran our digitization service. Um, but um, she had, prior to going to uh, information school, she had been a, um, uh, worked in, uh, in web design during the uh, tech boom and lost her job during the tech bust and uh, decided that uh, perhaps libraries were a, a good place to take those skills. 
Um, I look back on, on, on Christine Borgman's presentation this morning. Um, I share those decades that she talked about uh, the experience of, um, and it's, uh, it's interesting in thinking about how do we design a building that's right for millennials, and how do we know what millennials uh, need. Um, and so I'm not, not saying that it was a selection criteria, uh, criterion specifically, but the fact that, um, uh, that Shauna is a, uh, is a Gen X, um, putting her a little closer to the people that she was designing the facility for. Um, in some degree, the relative newness to, to her work, and, and, I, and she has you know, several years, she was, wasn't new, by any means, but also um, what I found in my experience of the first couple of years with her uh, was the, a tremendous openness. And I think in terms of involving people in their technology areas, that's a really essential quality. So um, there's a lot of things about the building I can talk about, but there's nobody better to talk about the technologies than Shauna. Thank you, Tom, that was uh, really kind. And uh, he had also threatened to point out that I had sun and wind burnt myself surfing on the weekend, so I appreciate that. <laughs> that wasn't part of my profile. Um, so yes, I am the technology officer for our fabulous new Taylor Family Digital Library. We're really excited about it. Um, I did work closely with Sextant Group, the technology consultants. Um, together we worked on about three quarters of the technologies uh, of the building together. Um, for those of you who are in a construction program, program yourself or about to be, um, with Sextant, uh, the services they provided, they wrote the narrative for the technologies, uh, spe specifications list, the issued for construction drawings, and they wrote the RFP for the AV integrator. And that's, tremendous amounts of work and they did it in a very professional and very detailed manner and I really appreciate the work that they brought to our building. We're a great success because of their excellence. Um, so planning the overall technology plan was an iterative process with several different groups. Uh, to meet our vision of a technologically progressive library, we did have to speak with lots of different people and I had to keep open ears for different ideas from different perspectives. One of them was a faculty member in our computer science department. Her name is Sheila Carpendale. She has spe specialty in touch technologies and visualization. And when I explained to her some of our ideas and our vision for the new building, she had tremendous enthusiasm. And not just enthusiasm, but she had postdocs and grad students who wanted to help us, which is best news we ever had. Uh, so Miguel Nascenta, he's a postdoc with Sheila who has specialties in touch technologies. He's actually moving to St. Andrews University very soon to be a professor there. And Uta Hendricks, who is, um, she has experience with touch technologies, but a lot of data visualization, especially in cultural heritage. So she brings some wonderful assets to our planning. Uh, we do have smart technologies across the street from us, which are very fortunate. So I sat down with their custom solutions folks, and we discussed again our vision. And together we have designed a few different uh, touch tables to um, help facilitate learning and research in our building. And I'll show you a few of them in a moment. The, um, the AV integrator, the successful AV integrator, Sharps Audiovisual, and that's Andrea uh, Cobbled, our project manager. And uh, they're the ones who have taken the Sextant program and ordered and installed it in our building. So we work very closely with them on the, more of the details and the realities of these technologies in the building. So one of the first areas, and certainly most popular right now in the building, is, are the student collaborative workrooms. As you can see, we've built in tables, but we've added a nice big 52-inch screen, a NEC P-series screen. Um, we have a Mac Mini that drives the content and a cable cubby that provides multiple cables for students to bring various input sources into the room. So if they want to bring in their own laptop, a VCR, a DVD player, an Xbox, whatever, they can bring that in the, into the room and use it. There is a Crestron control panel switch to switch the input sources. Um, we've also 
notice that we, we do have these rooms across three floors and managing these rooms, you know, who has it booked now, uh, we expect it to be a bit of an issue and we wanted to encourage peer management. And the students, as part of the process of uh, talking to them, they prefer a lot more self-service and we wanted to provide that for them. So we actually created this custom touch screen. You can see the pointer right here. This is a touch, uh, touch screen that we created. So it's on the outside door of every collaborative workroom. And above it, there's an LED light that shows uh, red or green, depending if the room's available or not. And the touch screen shows who has the room now, and students can also book the room right at the space. So we've had really positive response from students on this. Um, there's a little black space just underneath it. And we're just setting up our digital signage program right now. And we do plan to run some digital signage underneath. And we hope to do marketing of our programs and collections so far on this space. Um, an element that Sextant brought that we weren't aware of was this product from a company called Tidebreak. And the product that we're looking at here for this instance is TeamSpot. So when the students um, sit in the collaborative workroom together and they all have their own mobile technologies, in the past they independently would work on the file. But with TeamSpot, it turns that Mac Mini into a local server. So all the students can log in and work on the same file at the same time. So the file goes up on that big 52-inch screen, and the students all bring their mice from their mobile technologies to the big screen. To the big screen. They click on the screen, they take control, edit the text that everybody can see at the same time, and then another one can take control. And they take turns working on the same document at the same time. So we really wanted to facilitate collaboration and student group work. Um, and this is one of the ways we've uh, done so. We've done a, a gentle rollout of this software, taking small groups of students aside and teaching them this, and we've had really strong support for it. So we're excited to do the mass rollout. We've also added presentation practice rooms. Sextant Group was fantastic in this. Uh, they brought this to our attention and have built these in other libraries, so we were able to learn from the experience of others. What we do is we took the collaborative workroom and took it a step further. So it's the same layout, but the screens are a bit bigger and there's a webcam. And what the students do is they put their presentation on the screen, hit record, the webcam turns on and records the students practicing their presentation. They stop the presentation and they can review it so they can see where they're hesitating, maybe fidgeting too much, really practice before they go into the classroom. Uh, again, we're finding uh, a lot more uh, requirements from professors for students to do presentations and we're hoping that these facilities help our students be more successful in their programs. We also dedicated one room um, to a, we added a video conference system, so that way students can participate in conferences such as this in locations remote from our campus. In this new building, we have four classrooms where we teach students how to do research. As you can see, it's still under construction. The essence of where all those chairs are will be desks with computers. There will be a standard podium and projector and screen that we see in most classrooms. The podium is a campus standard, so that way our faculty who are presenting in this room when they go across campus and present elsewhere have a familiar setup so they, feel, they can feel successful in both locations. Now the company Tidebreak has a product called ClassSpot, and we invested in this one. They also have one called ClassSpot PBL, which we've decided to go with. So in ClassSpot, the instructor can control the content on all the screens and really empower the instructor. So the instructor can force content, his or her content, onto the student screens or possibly take a student screen and share that amongst the whole group as well as the uh, central presentation screen. The PBL aspect, can uh, the instructor can then break the classroom into small groups. So if they want to assign group tasks, you three computers, you work on this project, and then all three computers can collaborate at the same time, just like the student workrooms. Um, so that way that provides more interactive and collaborative opportunities for instruction in this space. Now I felt a little bit competitive when they came to these classrooms, so I wanted to take it just a step further than what other people have done. So on the side of the classrooms, and it's kind of hard to see here, but along this wall, each classroom will receive two 70-inch touch screens, and Andrea is leaning on one. Andrea and I are the same height. These screens are massive, and we've gotten them touch-enabled from NEC. 
So what the, when the instructor has control of not only the projector with the screen behind them, but the two touch screens on the side of the room as well. So maybe if you wanted to add additional content, maybe reference materials or any sort of additional information, they can do that. With the PBL aspect of the class bot, they can also turn those touch screens into part of the group work. So maybe those three desktops can now also have that touch screen as part of the group collaborative work. So we're really enhancing the interactive aspects of instruction. Like all new buildings, we all have digital signage. We have to have that. We've gone with the Omnivex system um, for a few different reasons. We felt they, they did understand our needs and could serve them better. Also, their products and development were along our lines as well. So we are currently working with them on interactive signage, similar to what you find in shopping malls right now. This is a quite a complicated, confusing building. So we're hoping that this touch interactive directional software will help us provide clarity to our students, also meeting their desire for more self-service. When I started this project, Tom gave me a very aggressive mandate, uh, not just only to be a technologically progressive library, but he also had asked for support for broadcast. And boy, that, that sure made the guys at Sexton and I scratch our heads. How are we going to do that? We really didn't know. Um, but they came through for me, good old Sexton, and they found a product called High Vision. And what this does is it encodes and decodes uh, through encoders and decoders. So. We're in Calgary, and close by is Banff. And of course, the Banff Center hosts several uh, fantastic arts, performing arts programs. So if we were to take one of our encoders, send it to Banff, they could c connect that to their video camera. The video camera records the, the performance. The encoder encodes that content, sends it over IP to our server room. The server room sends it to a decoder, which we have attached to a screen or a projector, and we can view the performance live. So, or as close to live as possible. So this is really exciting for us. The, the ability to packet real-time video data over IP is really exciting and made me really appreciate that we invested in the infrastructure. Um, we're going to work with High Vision and see if we can do interactive exhibits as well. As Tom mentioned, we do have the museum in this new building and we do have a strong mandate for new media art. And a big aspect of new media art is interactive exhibitions. So with High Vision, we're working with them to see if we can deliver interactive exhibitions remotely. So if there's an exhibit in Beijing, can our students participate in that exhibition from our campus? When some of the feedback we receive from our students and faculty as well is that they love our e-collections. We got strong support to keep building them. Um, issue they all had was that their, their desktop monitors are too small, that they, they love these e-collections, they have lots of windows open at the same time, but they just needed more surface area. So for students, we are building an LCD wall for them, and we're putting this touch table in front of it so the students can drive the content on the screens themselves. It's not a passive display board like we've seen in the past. The students are taking control. They put their content up. So again, with this touch table, it enables collaborative work, so group work on a nice big digital space. So we can hopefully facilitate group work with large e-collections and uh, hopefully it's in a very public space as well, so maybe inspire others. And Smart had delivered the actual lectern itself just as a demo trial for when we were practicing setup. So that's, I just had to grab a quick picture of it, they, but we couldn't install it until hopefully next week. Um, so when we did the original work with Sextant, um, I said to them, why are we just looking at information flat? What are some other innovative ways of looking at information? And they came back with this product called a digital globe. And why not look at things round? We don't have to look at things flat. And I thought that was a really exciting and fun way of looking at things. These are quite popular in science centers. And of course, any sort of area that wants to display things, especially geographically based, um, so again, we've received strong support from our faculty and students that have geographic um, leanings in their research, but last week I took the English department through, and one of their PhDs and faculty were really excited to use this as a means of displaying creative work, some creative writing, and uh, the PhD specifically said she wanted to display her poetry in a round space rather than just flat, and that provided lots of new opportunities for her. So I thought that was really exciting. Um, I was also, I'll say, told not just to have one for the public space, that we needed to have a second one that faculty could book. 
and use for their research, and they didn't want to share it with the undergrads. So, <laughs> so this looks like a, an interesting opportunity for us. As Tom had mentioned, we do have the museum in the building. Um, we do have a strong infrastructure in this space as well. Um, we, every 7.5 meters, we have floor boxes that contain electrical and data outlets, and they're mirrored on the ceiling as well. I worked with a faculty member in the fine arts department who specializes in digital art, and this was his recommendation, to provide lots of outlets in lots of places, not just the floor, but the ceiling, and that provides lots of opportunities for creative um, setups of their exhibitions. He also identified that one of the major issues is, is trying to discreetly place the equipment that runs these digital exhibitions. And so we had proposed a server room that with racks so they could be placed in the background rather than on the floor. And he was very supportive of that. So again, this is another way we're going to use the high vision system as the decoder encoder. Uh, so to do real time delivery of exhibitions in the museum as well. Um, Sexton brought this new product. They said, Shauna, this is so cool, you have to check this out. Uh, the company called Christie Digital has a new product out. It's about, about two years on the market now, and they're called Micro Tiles. And these are really quite fun. They're, I like to describe them as high resolution Lego blocks. So you can create any sort of screen that you want. And it's, it is really quite fun. And we've, uh, we did purchase 50 of them. And we're going to set, and it's, it's incredibly easy to set them up. And they talk to each other, and they do wonderful color and brightness balancing. And uh, the resolution really is quite stunning. Um, fantastic for marketing opportunities, impromptu exhibitions. Um, they really, the technical requirements is, is quite low, so it's easy to set up and take down. We did consider using them as a work display screen, but we've actually found that the brightness is too much that it's, it's a hard screen to work from because they're so bright and that it's much better for marketing. Um, so we've, I'm glad we kept it to the 50 and we also expect to use them in the museum as well. Overall, we, we are trying to create this flexible and dynamic technological support for the library, the archives, and the museum in the building. And to do this, we created um, an equipment pool is, to help support new ideas, new initiatives, and just to be a little bit more flexible and responsive to the needs of our, of our professionals in the building. Um, we've also found that it's also handy to hot swap items out. As you know, projectors goes down, it's awfully handy to have a couple spares in the equipment pool to do a quick swap. So that class that you're, is being taught tomorrow, that has a projector that's working. Um, so I had mentioned that Sextant helped us with three quarters of the technology in the building. So there's one quarter that we really took on ourselves. And when I was looking for inspirations, I, I kept coming back to Seattle Public Library. They have on their fifth floor reference desk a checked out data visualization screen. And they worked with a faculty member from UC Santa Barbara to create this exhibition. And so in our library, we're going to, this is an architectural rendering, the black and white, on the left, and that's what our reference desk is going to look like. On the right is what it looks like today without screens. Still waiting for those brackets to show up. Um, so what our challenge is, and we're gonna work with Sheila Carpendale in the Faculty of Computer Science on this project. We're gonna work on new and exciting ways of visualizing library data. Then we're gonna to shift to archival data, then to museum data, and then we're gonna take on the project of if, to see if we can converge all three and possibly bring in real-time delivery of these data sets. Um, we're hoping for um, innov innovative ways of expressing our data, especially behind-the-scenes data, so people have a greater appreciation for what happens behind the scenes, not necessarily what's happening on the library floor. Um, as, as we've been talking about is quite popular right now. How, we all understand that the students are bringing their mobile technologies with them and we want to support that. That's really exciting and good for us. Um, so when I started working on this, there were tremendous amounts of um, new ideas came to us and the students really were drivers of ways that we could support them with their mobile technologies. Um, first, again, part of that Google session and actually one of our archivists who is German uh, brought this information back. The, um, Free University of Berlin Library has just a beautiful new space and building. And it may be hard to see here, but they created these workspaces for students that um, nice and discreetly place a desk lamp, 
an electrical outlet, and a security bar so students can bring their, their mobile technologies with a Kensington lock or something. It's like a bicycle lock and they can lock it to the space. That way they can go to the washroom or go get a cup of coffee without having to ask the person next to them to look after their, their technology. So I took inspiration from that. We have new study spaces for our students. They're about four and a half feet wide. Lots of real estate because students sure have a lot of stuff with them now. And uh, it'll include an electrical outlet and a security lock. I'm hoping to do the desktop lamps as well, but that darn budget sure gets annoying, doesn't it? <laughs> um, we are also supporting mobile technology by including uh, electrical outlets throughout the floors, middle of the floors, everywhere, so that students can plug in and charge, charge their technologies. So to support the electrical outlets being mid-floor, we, we purchased furniture that is quite lightweight and easily rearranged. Um, not only that, but we talked to the interior designers and we found that there are new interior design standards for table height to support mobile technology. So the ergonomics of working on a laptop, a um, little bit lower, about two or three inches lower table height, and that way you know, your shoulders are a bit further down. It's much more comfortable to work long term on the tables. Um, we did incorporate bean bags. We understand that students do want their cozy spaces and we want to support that as well. Uh, we have just specced uh, laptop tables for bean bags as well. So they're, they're quite low given the bean bags that we've purchased and uh, we're looking forward to bringing them in to the building. I saw some pictures from Queensland University and they have these cubes right here and it turned out to be a California company makes outdoor furniture and which I thought was great because you know you can always take them outside and hose them down if they get too dirty from the students and these have been fantastic because they're incredibly lightweight and students are using them for multiple purposes not just seating but also as an extra table um, somewhere to put up their feet and just it's a quick nice easy way of, uh, of using the space. We, uh, we worked with the, the bookstore on our campus and we installed a vending machine that supports all sorts of, of items in it and some of them are to support mobile technologies. Uh, you'll see there's a USB key that's available, CDs, batteries. Uh, there is the Kensington lock available in this vending machine as well. Um, and then some of the more, I guess, mundane items like Tylenol and post-it notes and recipe cards. So uh, the students have responded positively to this. Um, this is in a section of the library that is open 24 hours, five days a week. So it's especially helpful for students when it's in the later hours. On the third floor of our new building, we are going to create a new media facility. The furniture's not installed yet, so the best picture I could show you was proof that we have bought the Mac Pro computers and the nice big cinema displays. Um, we're going to do 16 Mac Pro computers with the full Adobe suite and other innovative softwares to help students manipulate the the electronic collections we're providing for them. We will do 21 iMacs to do a little bit more lightweight editing software, four edit suites, two where they'll have Mac Pros and two PCs. We did the PCs because the Students Union funded innovative learning software, language learning software that provides feedback on your grammar, your use of the words, etc., your accent, um, and those are PC runs, so we're going to do PCs there. In this area, we're going to create a sandbox area, and this is where I'll provide a touch table that you see on the top and a digital globe. Both will have software development kits, so students can write their own programs. They can write their own expressions of knowledge in these spaces. We have started a gaming area. This will be very interesting to see how this goes over. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. There will be three areas. The first one is six PCs that are dedicated gaming PCs. They're terribly large and they're liquid cooled. Very, very powerful machines. The appropriate displays to go with them. And then we're going to do two console areas. The first one is a retrospective console area. So the Ataris, the Intellivisions, all sorts of wonderful console games that were out in the late 70s and early 80s. And then we're going to do a um, contemporary gaming area with the Xbox, the Wii's, the Kinect system, all sorts. Um, we do understand that um, the collection is, of course, very important to this. The Students' Union did fund part of the gaming collection. And it turns out we, it looks like we have the largest gaming collection in Canada and maybe North America now. So uh, we will certainly become quite active. Our faculty across campus in all different departments are, are giving us tremendous support for this initiative, not just to look at gaming as a research area, but also to express knowledge in gaming form. So we will purchase uh, software development kits again for gaming areas so that our faculty and researchers can express themselves in gaming form. Um, we do have 
support for new media art, not just for professional artists, but for our students as well. And so in the middle of our information, in our, our learning commons right now, is our first student art exhibit. And this is a graduate student from computer, com computational media design. And it's an elevator that has retina readers inside. And you look at screens, and the characters respond to where you're looking. So it's a very interesting piece. And it just happens to look exactly like our elevator doors. So we're hoping people aren't getting too confused with our elevators versus the art piece. But it's certainly getting attention. And we really want to support the student work and help them uh, with the success of their projects and their work. Just quickly, we did invest in RFID for our building. Uh, all the books in this building are RFID tagged. We did um, invest in a book sortation unit, and that's the ingest station right there. I want to turn quickly to our support for high-end research in this building. Um, I did work with Sheila Carpendale and her graduate students. As you can see, this is just a rendering that we've developed. And this right here is a cube wall that'll have high resolution displays. So in, I had earlier mentioned that students and faculty want more real estate for all their digital collections. Well, this is our, our response to the faculty, the high level research end. So it will be in essence a floor to ceiling, wall to wall, high resolution cube wall. On the sides, you'll see that there are touch screens mounted to the wall. The computer will probably be mounted that controls all the content to a touch table. And that way, again, it's a collaborative space. Faculty do tend to work in groups, uh, bringing graduate students. So that way, um, you know, it's a collaborative, friendly area. And of course, we'll have furniture that is lightweight and movable as well. So faculty can create their own spaces in the building. This is the committee that's helping me design and build this room. They are representatives from across campus, all the different disciplines, and of course the library. <laughs> the computer science students made it very clear to me that this is how they want to search the library catalog. This is the type of room, this is the, the look and feel that they want, and so I, I, I think I'm going to have my hands full with them to help design this for our library. Uh, this is what they, uh, what they expected maybe for our physics department, the astronomical physics, so that look images of the sun and the data related to the sun, and maybe on the side screen some related data that may be used as reference. Being Calgary, we have strong oil and gas, so the geosciences is a very strong area of our, our, on our campus. And so in this instance, there's an actual image of the mountain, a topogra topographical map, some data, and again, reference materials. In this instance, they're looking at the touch table with GIS applications, where there's multiple layers and annotation involved. And again, because it's a flat surface, it is group oriented. So many people can do many touches and all collaborate on the same uh, file at the same time. This one is one of my favorites. This is actually a poster presentation. So those screens on the side um, can support interactive posters. So it's not just a static, but you know, when people create their posters, why not embed files, videos, some sort of new media pieces that relate to their research? Also might be a little more interesting for those of us who are visiting their poster presentations. <laughs> And this one is the sound visualization. We have some wonderful faculty doing some really interesting work in this field. And lastly, this is uh, an instance where possibly the president of the university is bringing a potential donor into the building and showing them a dynamic, interesting, inspiring space that wouldn't they love to be a benefactor for this campus that's doing innovative work. So uh, I just really quickly want to identify where I found um, inspiration and new ideas from for this building. First of all, thank you, Tom, for allowing me to travel so extensively. I, I really did find not only looking at websites of other institutions and libraries, but getting out there and talking to them and seeing them. And, and I thought some of these other spaces were so generous at offering uh, what worked for them, but a lot of them were quite generous, I'll say, with what didn't work and what mistakes I should not um, make on my own. Um, of course, being a good librarian had to do my literature search, and these three works had strong um, resonance with me and the work, especially when it came to the undergraduate planning of spaces. Um, this transformation lab report from Denmark, I just, I found it so inspiring. Uh, there, 
I, I couldn't copy the work that they, the new media work that they implemented in their library, but I found their work so fearless, so inspiring. And when I found myself bogged down with administrative work and I had to get myself back into a creative space, I'd often turn to this report and, and find inspiration from them every time. Quickly, um, I am faculty at the University of Calgary, and this one article really spoke to me and gave me that light bulb aha moment. It's an article by Jeffrey Huang in the Harvard Business Review. And in this article, he argues that retail spaces have a physical space that they've worked really hard to develop over the years. And they're now creating virtual spaces for their website, for shopping experience to happen virtually on the internet. And what he's arguing is that architecture firms and companies need to start taking their virtual space and put it inside their physical space to facilitate the customer experience within the retail to really heighten that experience. To me, that strongly resonated as library is place, digital library, and can we bring the digital library into the physical library and enhance the student research and learning experience within the physical space? So for me, that moving forward, that's my personal question that I'm going to be working on. And I have this fantastic new building as a research lab to work on that question. Thank you very much. Please, yes. Um, hi, I'm Andy Ashton from Brown University. Um, this is almost overwhelming what you guys are doing here, and I'm sure it feels that way to you some days as well. Definitely. Um, I have a number of questions. Um, one is, uh, what is the, the actual software that drives a lot of this? Uh, is it something that's provided by Smart? Is it provided by some of these other consultants? Or is it uh, something that you've engaged with your faculty in developing? custom software, especially for the touch devices and the visualization walls? Sure, sure. It, yeah, it's all the above. Ah. <laughs> it's, it's a real mixture. Um, for the touch tables, um, Smart wrote the software uh, for some of them. Um, we are using on just the flat uh, touch tables that are normal work height. It's, it's really just a, a standard PC that's on a touch surface. And, and we are working with students to see how they use it. Um, big driver for that was when Windows 7 came out, that's multi-touch enabled. And so we thought, why not just provide this new computer that's flat instead of vertical for students to work on in a collaborative manner. So I think that's certainly an area that we're, we're going to work on and further develop. Right now, it's, it's just a computer. Part of our partnership with, uh, with SMART is really a research project for them, for them to learn from, from our experience. So um, right now we're, we're projecting a lot of uh, potential realities, um, but I'm sure that we'll get, hopefully we'll get smarter every day, uh, no pun intended. Um, uh, but um, um, we haven't written very much software of our own at this point, and uh, by and large, we, we hope not, but exceptions are? The, um, the workroom booking system that showed you we had that custom screen for, uh, we have written our own code in the past, and uh, well, I did look at proprietary systems, because there are quite a few out there that are really designed for the corporate environments. The logic of the software did not uh, speak to our needs, and to customize that software was a tremendous amount of money. So we decided to go with a custom screen and utilize our own software. I'll ask one more because there's nobody standing behind me. Okay. But um, <laughs> just going forward, how do you um, how do you kind of strategically manage these? How do I put this? A, a lot of these technologies have the risk of becoming just curiosities, right? They're, they're interesting, they're cool, they're whizzy. Um, how do you sort of assess both whether or not they actually are meeting the need that you're identifying, and also as new things come up, how do you sort of plan, fund, uh, address the need for new technologies? Because what, from what I see here, you're very much, 
I think, ahead of where uh, many institutions are. Um, and it, that's risky, right? So uh, do you ha is there an ongoing process? Is it, you know, can you just speak to kind of how you picture moving forward once this is established? Sure, sure. I'll, how about if I start this and you make sure I get everything right? Um, so absolutely, I think one of the issues we discussed early on in this project is our biggest fear is dust on technology. And we've all seen it. And it's just it's heartbreaking. Um, so right now, we are in the process of just finalizing purchasing and transferring those purchases into installations and operationalizing this work. And as you say, how do we make sure that it remains relevant to our students and faculty? So um, we are empowering our, new, our staff in new ways. Uh, we do have one librarian who's in charge of reference and instruction, and she's quite engaged with the students and the touch tables right now. And again, getting the feedback, setting up workshops, lots of different ways of, of interacting and keeping the dialogue open. So that way we can utilize our programmers to develop in ways that the students and the faculty want. So as you say, they remain relevant and we don't have dust on them. Um, yeah? Um, myself, um, moving forward again, as you say, how do we keep keep ahead of the curve or how do we stay with the curve and not just get stuck with the technologies we have today and again um, I understand moving forward that that's maybe part of my role is as emerging technologies and to keep an eye on on the environment and to um, maintain the connections that I have made and to grow those connections with other librarians and other you know, maybe non-library industry maybe computer science and and some of the other cultural institutions who are technologically progressive as well museums science centers etc and uh, there's lots to learn from all sorts of people. There are certainly things that we're, that we're not presently staffed and sufficiently knowledgeable uh, in, in our, in our uh, uh, you know, the, the current range of our expertise. So uh, running the visualization lab, uh, probably that's a, that's a physics postdoc. Uh, we don't have one. Uh, on our staff, so that is one of the positions that we expe that we ex you know, expect to be uh, recruiting for uh, once that we have that uh, installed. Um, the area of the broadcasting that I talked about, um, really to to have a, a media background and understand how to take full advantage, as well as make the kinds of reciprocal arrangements and so forth. That are necessary to uh, to deal with both the uh, the logistics, the financial costs, the uh, copyright uh, concerns, and so forth, um, is is really an area that, in fact, libraries are not staffed for as well. So there are positions that we built a requirement for that we really don't have that expertise base today, and uh, and that's and that's very challenging. On the other hand. If we only designed what we already have the capacity to do, how would we advance? So we have to take these chances. I have a question about budget. In your presentation, you mentioned the $13 million technology plan. Is that, did you expend that entire amount in, on what you've described, or did you hold some of it back to sort of create an endowment that would pay for some of the replacement of equipment and changes and upgrades, or how, do, how are you thinking about this? Mm -hmm. yep. The um, $203 million that are involved in this project are a mixture of, of uh, money from the uh, province of Alberta, um, from the uh, uh, Don and Ruth Taylor, um, who, who made a personal gift of $25 million, and uh, also from the federal government, and, um, um, and, in, and specifically some of the, uh, of the money from that grant went into the technology budget. Um, also we were actually successful in getting the, the city of Calgary to uh, Give 3.2 million dollars towards the the um, the museum space. Um, 
but that money was given to realize this and really the ability to set any portion of it aside uh, is not you know is not something we can do and so what we you know so we have built um, a demand that we don't have a substantial endowment to support over time we have had some successful fundraising for endowments and we're actively proceeding on that right now we couldn't get out ahead of the building so the building is part of the convincing of potential donors um, to support those developments over time so it was a, a situation where um, you use it or you lose it uh, there was a moment in time when we had to actually cut $40 million out of the building cost. So in fact, it was not that, uh, uh, that we ever really had, more, had, had money that we weren't using. We really had to fight to hang on to the technology budget um, because we also had to, to deal with the high density storage facility. And one of the great things that, that's to some degree, well, it's not really clearly apparent in this image, but uh, one of the things that the private donors asked, demanded, was that a certain amount of the money be used for landscaping in front of the building. So that actually, it's, it's right in the center of the campus and the uh, area in front of it offers us tremendous op opportunities for external activities that, that play uh, and uh, interact with uh, the programs inside the building. So, um, so everything will be you know, close to grade on day one, um, and yet we'll have uh, substantial challenges. But it's not that libraries didn't have these kinds of challenges in the past. Um, and hopefully, the kinds of technologies that we've implemented are really, um, we waited till the last moment for a lot of these. One, to know what the hottest thing of the moment was, and was there a better product, but also for certain things, might get less expensive by the time we actually got to the point of purchasing them. So um, uh, I don't think we've been irresponsible about this, um, but it does leave us with, with challenges. And it's not in, in it, and the answer really can't get any simpler than that, unfortunately. And are you expecting to make any of these services a fee for service to try to generate some revenue stream that? could pay for future upgrades, replacements? One of the, there are some, there's some great spaces in this building. And the potential to, uh, to rent those spaces out with the techno technologies that are there and so forth certainly is there. Um, we have, We've started out being resistant to that because we really don't want to lose control of the spaces. I mean, essentially, if you'll do it for money, you know, then, then you're really, you, you, um, you need to respond to the people who have the money because that becomes the objective of doing that. Um, we would like to avoid that so that, in fact, that we can choose the things that are educationally supportive, that are community drivers, that will enhance the university uh, and enhance our role in the, in the larger uh, world endeavor. Um, saying that, um, you know, we, we also know that we have an asset base that, that potentially um, we could utilize. One of, the, one of the things that we didn't show, it, it hasn't been implemented yet, is a, is a cafe in the building. Uh, we personally will not get the proceeds of that. But it will be the, you know, it'll be the hottest cafe on campus. There is no doubt about that. That the tables sit out right out against these open windows and so forth, and uh, I, have, you know, so I am sure that a lot of, of goods will be sold there, and the university will uh, that that is centrally supported, and so that that money will go go into the general university coffers. But our capacity to contribute to that is is important. So uh, in our concept of the building, we have not implemented that kind of, of um, uh, asset or exploitation. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, Mary Ellen Davis with the Association of College and Research Libraries. Great presentation. I'm sure many of us want to book our tickets and come visit right away, or when the rest of it is installed. Um, I was, uh, comment, I was struck, um, I'm sorry, what? October, yeah. okay. We'll, we'll say Everybody comes in October. Great <laughs> tours, be lots of fun. Yeah. I, I was struck that it seems so far ahead of its time, and um, I'll, we may all be interested to go back and compare. Last uh, June, I believe it was, ACRL released a Future Scenarios Thinking for Academic and Research Libraries that was based on um, hundreds of academic and research libraries doing evaluation of future scenarios. And there were some scenarios in there similar to this, and now I'm, I'm, my phone is dead so I can't look it up, but I'm dying to go back and see how many thought it would be realized in 2011, because I think many of us thought it was further away, and I'm wondering sort of what inspired you to make this reality now as opposed to saying, oh, it's too big. I mean, how did you decide to stretch like this? Well, it was, um, it was a terrific opportunity. Um, and um, to, I mean, I personally, I feel like it's one of the, you know, the, the greatest opportunities that someone in, in my line of endeavor could ever have, which is uh, um, to really think about, well, how would all the pieces fit? But also, uh, when we did the strategic studies, one of the things that we were, that just shocked people was that we were not supporting research in the way that people expected us to support research. And as a result, that there was a large portion of the campus we were not connecting with. And so we thought about how can we how can we change our capabilities in a way that will address? And a lot of those uh, areas of research were really on the cutting edge. And, um, and an example for the building, and this is, this is so exciting for me, uh, even though it may not be, um, may not be funded, but I, uh, uh, in the science faculty on campus, uh, they put together a $20 million proposal on uh, image and visualization center for the university and with a huge number of disciplines involved mostly in the sciences and engineering uh, but also in education and also in in digital humanities and uh, in architecture and design and in the um, visual and we should have incorporated for the proposal one we were right at the front of the proposal as an enabler for this and for the visual, they had the vertical slices of the various disciplines and the research they would do, and they were, were, the, um, were the slices of activity within their model uh, for this image and visualization center. And, and then around the top and the bottom and the sides were the enablers of it. And so one set of enablers were the development of, uh, of technological app, of, of software applications and so forth. Across the top as an enabler was the digital library, and that we had convinced them that we could play that kind of role in cutting edge uh, research uh, was in many ways, you know, it was it was you know tremendously uh, reaffirming for us that we were moving in the right direction and that we could make um, uh, the library and the museum and the archives actually a, a very active and central player uh, and enabler for, you know, for 2020 research. So, um, you know, what, what, you need to go for that. Um, and then you, you, you know, <laughs> Shana, her comment about how I said, you know, we wanted to broadcast, we just, the other day, I. She was explaining this to me. I said, explain that again. And she said, you said that's what you wanted. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but I didn't quite realize that. It, and I, how does that work again? Uh, so um, we really, once we got the momentum going, and I will say that it's a little challenging for, for everyone to be able to conceive of how this you know, plays in their professional space and so forth. But we've already begun to get lots of, of instances of people uh, understanding what the new capability is and beginning to run with it. 
uh, at this point at least intellectually, uh, if, and, and for most of it they really can't practice it yet. But we think this will also raise the quality of our general capabilities and, and potential for contributions. I'd like to add just quickly that when I was managing the institutional repository, when I was working with the faculty on their research that I was depositing, I was so inspired by the work they were doing. It was so innovative, so exciting. I was so happy to facilitate the dissemination of it. But I could see that there were facilities that were missing, particularly for departments that were not terribly wealthy. And that, what I thought was really the strength of the libraries, we're the great equalizer. Can we provide these labs, these facilities, for the not so wealthy departments and really facilitate their growth and, and help them become wealthy? Um, and also my time on the reference desk and in the learning commons, the information commons, and spending the time with the students and watching them work as groups and bring in their mobile technologies and ask questions, you know, how can I do this and why can't I do that? And, and go, oh, we, we should be supporting this. And, and then when we had the opportunity, I, you know, I, I had some ideas and I proposed them and here we are today. So thank you for your question. I'm Mark Stover from San Diego State University. I have two questions. One is um, I'm intrigued about the loss of the $40 million and what you had to cut out um, when, you, when you discovered that you wouldn't have that money to spend. And then um, another question is uh, how many FTE staff this building and about what is the percentage breakdown between public service staff and behind the scenes staff? So, uh, <clears throat> in answer to your first question about what did we, uh, did we have to cut out of the building when we had to cut 40 million, and it was, um, it was a wild weekend, and uh, I still remember it was this, the weekend, I think, it was a Sunday night, and, and basically, I worked with a, a, a consultant in, um, in Vancouver, and so, um, what we really knew was is that if we did not make the cuts, that the cuts would be made for us. And so we wanted to control, maintain control of the program. And so uh, for two days, I was sort of saying, and, and Jackie Bell had said to me, she said, Tom, you can't, we're not gonna get 40 million by nickel and dimes, you know. Uh, we've really gotta, gotta um, give up some, some areas. And one of the things that we decided was that we wanted to keep the museum. Uh, we really think that university museums are, um, are challenged, uh, that they need an opportunity to take their, um, their riches into the principal research and teaching mission of the university. And the way they're created as autonomous entities, they're not well positioned to do that. So we not only have brought them into the building, but we create a, a center for arts and culture that actually makes them a programmatic element of a, of a research and, and teaching support area. Um, and so we, we chose to save that. The one, the, the one that we hated to give up was the, uh, uh, the faculty innovation in, in learning and teaching. And we, um, we really thought that having them in the building, people who are shaping uh, new technology applications for faculty members, that we could employ the same technologies, that we could use some of the same facility, that it was a very synergistic um, uh, possibility. And um, they, were the, they were the last one we gave up. We gave up a number before that to, to come up with 40 million. Um, but, but uh, we have kept as a partner in the building and has been crucial to our design from the first, um, the um, student, uh, student Enrollment Services has a major area on the third floor called the Student Success Center. And they'll, they'll provide uh, learning resource support and um, student advising, assistance to students with, with disabilities. And what we want is their programs and our programs to be overlaid in such a fashion that in fact that students can't tell whose programs what and that we really really strengthen uh, the support for student success by by both those organizations and once again it puts this this uh, uh, library facility 
uh, in more areas that are critical to, to the success of the university. So we've been looking at ways how we can make ourselves crucial. Um, the, um, the question about uh, the number of, of staff, it's about uh, 236 is the, I think is the total number right now. Um, and, um, and that doesn't really include all of our contractual relationships with the provincial government and so forth, but it does include the things that are, that are central to the operation of this building. Uh, regarding how many are involved in, um, in public service uh, versus the, the back end of the building uh, operation, um, I'll have to say I don't, I don't think about the staffing in that, in that fashion. Uh, and so I can't give you uh, an exact number, and part of that is because the, of the reorganization which we implemented in 2009 is really being carried out really this year, uh, is going to move staff from one area to another. Um, it is going to focus more staff on the research areas and trying to um, promote uh, a um, new opportunities for us to support campus research and for us to be an instigator uh, of campus research as well. Um, on the public service side, um, we do see the change in the pattern of, of requests at, at public service um, points and we do believe that, um, well, it's really clear, you don't have as many questions and they're not as complex as they used to be. So in fact, we need to devote more of those resources in ways that, as Shauna describes, the collaborative workrooms, that they can manage their own uh, use of the spaces, and, um, but also their own use of the services. So we're kind of, um, we're in the process of, of rewriting uh, that area. I, I think it'll be, you know, I think we'll be well into to 2012 before we really get all of the uh, necessary adjustments. On the other hand, when we started doing the strategic study, we thought, on day one, we thought we were designing for the building. But very soon, we realized that it actually was a strategic realignment that was really about the nature of 21st century services, and that the building was a match with that, but that the building wasn't driving it that those were things we should be doing, changes we should already be making of our own accord, but that we'd be able to realize them through the vehicle of the building. One more. Michael Dula from Pepperdine University. You talked about the importance of this being a student-centered design effort rather than a librarian-centered effort. Could you talk a little bit about how you involve the students? What kind of methods you use to get them involved in the process? I knew I was going to get that question. Um, as Tom had mentioned, we, we did those six teams, and some of the interviews that we did were it did include students. Um, I am the liaison with our students' union, so I did keep in close touch with both the president and the VP academic for some decisions that were made, and I remain in contact with them to help students drive decisions that will shape the building. Um, we had several variables that prevented us from maybe doing as extensive collaboration and you know, work with the students as we would like to. You know, I mean, obviously, there's all the work done by Susan Gibbons and the Ohio Report and Joan Lippincott that discusses integrating students with your planning and design, and we are certainly supportive of that. And I think if we could do it over again, we would maybe try and control those variables more to include student response. But it, um, we did try. We really did. And maybe moving forward, uh, we have discussed amongst the librarians that uh, we can involve students and maybe. Um, once the building's up and running, and we've had a few semesters under our belt, you know, discussing with the students how we can shape it. I think Susan, Susan Gibbons had a, had a great idea. You know, she asked students to take pictures of their favorite spots in the building, and that'll give us information of areas not to change, and also where in the building they feel lost, and, and that'll really help us, you know, identify those those um, spots that need fixing. So, 
I think I think Shauna is is uh, correct in uh, uh, you know in describing the challenges of of meaningful student involvement. But I also want to um, say that the relationship with the student government is a is a terrifically strong one, and I've never seen a student the undergraduate student government uh, receives from the Board of Governors uh, a large body of money each year and they choose what they want to spend it on on what they think is critical to the to student success and um, um, they have always given chosen various projects in the library um, the media area that uh, that Shauna described um, they gave us $165,000 uh, to support that out of the, the funds they have. Um, so we have a, a very close and, and tight relationship. And, I, and, and my favorite award that, that we've received since, um, since I've been there is, is that uh, um, last year we uh, won the Student President's Award for uh, uh, for our our lead contribution to student success, so even though uh, getting the kind of involvement we like uh, would like is challenging, uh, we do have a we do have a, a rich relationship, and we just need to, to take advantage of it going forward. I think that's probably it. I think it's six o'clock, and it may be serving drinks. So let's go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.